want to have a chance to update you about uh, the genomic medicine uh, working group. Uh, just to give you a sense, of, a reminder about why it is that this working group was formed. Uh, you'll recall that the strategic plan has this uh, right, the so-called right-hand side. Uh, we keep talking about moving to the right. That's not a political statement, but um, it is on this diagram, moving towards advancing the science of medicine and improving the effectiveness of, of health care. And so there's a number of programs uh, that the NHGRI has established that our initial early forays into this process. And uh, what we wanted to use this working group to do was to think about uh, how we actually are going to achieve the goals of moving in that direction, uh, what is actually going on in the field, and to try to figure out what role NHGRI should play to support and accelerate this uh, process. So the goals of the uh, Met genomic medicine effort were to identify research directions and priorities, promote collaboration amongst existing groups, stimulate investigator-initiated efforts and issue funding solicitations as needed. You'll hear more about that in a minute. Establish the working group as a subcommittee of council, which includes a rotating membership, at least one council member, and with the key element of reporting back to council. And so, did this just stop working? Hmm. All right, I guess I'll step close. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is uh, give you the, one of those reports back to council. So the charge was to plan a few uh, genomic medicine meetings uh, to provide guidance in areas such as ongoing infrastructure needs, identifying needs related to future collaborations and reviewing process and the overall uh, implementation. This is the current uh, working group. Uh, you can see it includes uh, Pearl and myself, current council members, former council member uh, Jeff Ginsburg, and I guess you'll probably need to add a new council member to uh, make sure you have somebody actively on that. Um, it's been a very active and engaged group and we've been uh, doing a lot of phone calls and uh, meeting activities. One of the things that uh, they have been involved in is trying to help come up with a definition for what genomic medicine is. Uh, it's actually helpful to have a definition and it's uh, remarkable just how much debate the group has had about trying to come up with a definition. Uh, the definition that we have agreed to, and I should note that for those of you that want to take a look, it's for the council members. This is available in the electronic council book, so you can go take a look at that. But the current definition uh, that we're proposing is an emerging medical discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care, for example, for diagnostic or therapeutic decision making, and the other implications of that clinical use. So there was, a, like I said, enormous amount of debate amongst the group about this definition. Some thought it was too narrow, but it was de decided that it should be purposefully narrow. Uh, by genomic, NHGRI means direct information about DNA or RNA. Downstream products are outside the immediate view. NHGRI recognizes the dominant portion of its current portfolio appropriately support, supports the foundational research that will ultimately contribute to this. There's an enormous amount of activity that's going on in uh, the strategic areas one, two, and three, which contribute to understanding w the role the genes play in disease, and then ultimately to identify uh, genes that uh, may actually be predictive or uh, diagnostic of disease. Fourth and fifth, uh, NHGRI strategic plan domains capture the research umbrella that really fall under the domain of uh, genomic medicine. And um, metaphorically, they view this as a destination for attaining the mission of improving health through genomics research. So it really is about getting to the uh, right-hand side of that strategic uh, vision diagram. So what are uh, the activities? Well, there have been a slew of them, and just uh, taking a few from the website, uh, you can see the schedule here. There was a genomic medicine symposium that kicked this whole process off. 
uh, in June of uh, 2011, and I'll give you a little bit more detail about this in the future. Uh, there was a characterizing and displaying genetic variants for clinical action workshop that actually led to an RFA that's currently outstanding. There was a uh, Genomic Medicine II meeting that was held here in, uh, or held in Bethesda. There was a Genomic Medicine III meeting that was held back in Chicago. And there's a Genomic Medicine IV meeting that is currently uh, in planning for uh, June, uh, for uh, January. So the goal for Genomic Medicine I was just to get people together who uh, were doing things in that space to identify common areas of interest that they had, uh, to define demonstration projects, to think about if there were collaborative activities that could begin to study how we move to that uh, side of the strategic plan, and to stimulate uh, development of a consortium for conducting translational research. And I think uh, it's fair to say that everybody was really quite surprised by the amount of material that was available at the Genomic Medicine I meeting. And it was an interesting meeting because it was an on your, di on your own dime meeting. It brought together a large collection of people who were so passionately committed to this area that uh, they were actually willing to pay and come to the meeting uh, just to, to talk about it. And one of the things, uh, we, we learned a, a lot of things, but one of the things that we really learned was that there were a very large number of institutions that have used institutional funds to make a huge commitment to this area. So there were really a large group of people that were actively involved, and we spent some time talking about the challenges. And the key challenges were limited evidence and consensus on which genomic variants are still are medically relevant. Uh, there was a lot of debate about clinical utility, clinical validity, actionability, the definition of each of those words. And I, I must say, I think it's still fair to say that uh, we're still having some of that debate. One of the issues that came up regularly was that as you think about moving into clinical care, one of the things that always drives clinical care in this country is mechanisms of reimbursement. And so that was something that surprisingly came up very early in that initial discussion. And then there was also a lot of discussion about the burden to patients and clinicians, and especially, I think, to clinicians, of assay intervening and following up in genomic findings. It's clear that a lot of the physicians that uh, are involved in or likely to become involved in genomic medicine uh, are ill-prepared to do that. Uh, we're already seeing a flood of physicians reporting people showing up in their office with their 23andMe or similar report uh, and saying, hey, doc, what does this mean for me? And they're uh, not well uh, prepared to ex explain in many cases. So this is a really an area that we need to think about. And again, how that fits into the normal workflow where a physician might have seven minutes to spend with their typical patient, it creates a, a, a real burden. There's a summary manuscript uh, and an implementation roadmap uh, that's out now under uh, review that will report the outcomes of this meeting. Genomic Medicine II then was to build on that and to develop ideas for uh, multi-center collaborative projects to expand the group of people that was present at the first meeting to find even additional ones, and there were quite a few that uh, we learned about to identify infrastructure needs, and to establish mechanisms for sharing of best practices. And we heard from some institutional leaders uh, some really important uh, features about what it takes to make genomic medicine successful at your place. Um, we heard that you need to make genomic medicine part of the institutional strategic plan. It can't be just an add-on. It has to really be uh, part of the plan. You need to demonstrate uh, value, especially in the cost arena, but actually one of the things that we learned in a subsequent meeting is it's not just about cost, it may be about adoption of, uh, of a medication or of a test that uh, you could demonstrate uh, value. And uh, I, I thought it was really nice to see that genomic medicine from the standpoint of a leader uh, actually of, of St. Jude's Medical Center said this needs to be part of the cake, not just the icing on the cake. It really needs to be fully baked into the healthcare system if it's going to be, if it's going to be successful. One of the main things that came out of Genomic Medicine II was a series of task forces. Uh, you can see them listed here, but there was one in the area of cancers, one in the area of family history, periodontal microbiome, clinical research interface, pharmacogenomics, and uh, genome sequencing. 
And these groups have been very active, uh, a large number of uh, phone calls. Uh, they met again at the Genome Medicine 3 work group uh, in breakouts and uh, continue to do some of their work. I'll just note one here that uh, Pearl O'Rourke uh, is leading, which emphasizes uh, an interesting problem that this whole area of genomic medicine is going to create for us, and that is it is at the interface between what's clinical activity and what's research activity, and how does that interface become fuzzier and fuzzier as we start to integrate these things more and more. And I think that's really a, 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 a really important topic for uh, us as we think about genomic medicine going forward. Genomic Medicine 3 then uh, reviewed the early stage deliverables from each of these task forces, uh, started to identify barriers and focus on them, particularly with the whole question of reimbursement and some of the other stakeholders, and to develop uh, additional approaches for collaborating amongst the genomic medicine centers. You see this one comes up at virtually every, every meeting. What were the barriers that were identified? Well, the lack of evidence for benefit and value, and hence uh, we need to think about how we get some of that uh, evidence. Uh, institution and physician acceptance. One of the real challenges everybody reported was that even at an academic, uh, major academic medical center, uh, there is a wide range of willingness to become uh, involved in, in these kinds of activities. Education of patients and physicians is a key element that needs to be worried about. Consents. Are our consents appropriately constructed to uh, really allow us to take advantage of this? There are issues about sample availability and uh, the breadth and uh, extent of those. And there are also a lot of issues around the recruitment of participants in genetic studies. These kinds of genomic medicine activities create a real opportunity to do that but they also create some uh, uh, social and ethical issues, I think, that need to be uh, well thought through before we get too far down that path. So uh, the conclusions from Joma Medicine 3 were to take up the challenge of partnering with payers to identify uh, evidence for outcomes. Uh, and this actually is going to be the topic of, an, of another meeting that will be held in the not too soon future. There's a lot of discussion about whether we need a Center for Medical Technology Policy and how does that get implemented. We thought a lot about uh, how to design study and metrics to do the right things for patients in these space uh, from the payers rather than try to understand why they are paying. So it needs to be part of the process of why do uh, we need to have this as part of the medical process. And then there was a lot of discussions about needing to broaden this beyond NHGRI and uh, look at other uh, ICs. Uh, how have they partnered with folks to make sure that new discoveries in their domains actually get integrated in, in, into healthcare? And there are a lot of obvious uh, partners you could imagine meeting with. And then finally, uh, as comes up over and over again, and in Eric's uh, report about the um, IOM roundtable, uh, the economic discussions are a key driver of this and need to be an important part of our uh, efforts going forward. Currently under development are plans for genomic medicine four. It's going to be held uh, in uh, January. And the goal there is to bring professional organizations and societies who actually already have experience about establishing clinical practice guidelines and how do you integrate thing, uh, new discoveries into that. So we want to learn what their uh, approaches are to do that, understand the process for establishing new guidelines, and to explore how to facilitate integration of genomic medicine into best practices where it makes sense. Finally, there was a meeting uh, that happened in December which was on characterizing and displaying genetic variants uh, for clinical action. Uh, this now, as you know, is outstanding as an RFA. This was one of the things that came out of this group. Uh, the meeting uh, gathered perspectives on the need for such a resource. Uh, the group was unanimous that uh, a resource such as this was needed, uh, that current approaches for identifying uh, variants uh, could be greatly improved and we needed a place to capture and uh, be able to uh, annotate those kinds of uh, e variants and, and how they link to phenotype. We recognize that there's a translation loop here as phenotype, genotype, 
correlations are identified. Uh, they will constantly be changing in terms of the evidence that supports them. And so it was clear that there's a translation loop that needs to be put in place so that as new evidence is uh, uncovered, as, uh, as identified, that that new evidence gets uh, put back into this process and either upgrades or downgrades any uh, recommendations that you might have for thinking about the clinical utility, clinical validity, or actionability of, of that. And then how to think about translating this into uh, practice-based medicine. Uh, and so there were a variety of recommendations that came out of that. The key elements being we need to capture uh, these variants and the clinical annotations that go with them. We need to promote, uh, promote annotation of both germline and somatic variants. We need to capture all variants and associated phenotypes because uh, as people uncover new variants, one of the in questions they keep asking is, well, has anybody else seen this before? And uh, what, is it, what does it mean? We need to support research into this whole question of clinical utility, clinical validity. We need to facilitate the developments of best practice guidelines, uh, one of the topics for a future genomic medicine meeting. Uh, we need to encourage dissemination of support logic. All of this only works if the physicians that are actually using it in the clinic have decision support tools that enable them to uh, have additional information available to them uh, to help make their decisions. And then to develop mechanisms to update this new data so that this uh, translational loop that I described can actually be implemented. So uh, to conclude my part of the presentation, I'll just say that uh, it's thinking that it was a year and a half ago that the first group met in uh, Chicago. Uh, there's been an amazingly rapid evolution of this process. We've gone from really realizing that there actually is a lot of activity out there. We need to capture it. Some of it's very, very exciting. And uh, that all of this has been funded on really local institutional commitments. Uh, that uh, healthcare providers actually care about genomic medicine. That was a clear lesson that we learned from the Genomic Medicine 2 meeting. At the Genomic uh, Medicine 3 meeting, we actually had a few payers, and we learned that they too also care a great deal ab about this process. So we've gone from finding out what's out there to actually moving towards a meeting that will actually help us think about, okay, well, what does it actually take from payers and providers to put this in, into practice. So I would say that in a year and a half, that's been a pretty rapid evolution. And uh, Terry used this slide uh, in the presentation that she and Jeff Ginsburg gave uh, a year ago, um, where she said we were going to try to avoid meeting hell. I have to say, we failed. Um, but I think all of us that have been involved in the process uh, think that it's been well worth it. So Terry. And I might note, yeah, we, we solved the problem of the cold coffee by not giving any at all. So <laughs> um, there are solutions. Okay. Um, so I thought in, in addition to talking about the meetings we've held, and I don't think it's even been a year and a half, Rex. It's been, you know, since June of, of 2011. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, the, and actually you've heard these from Eric, a number of funding opportunities, the pilot demonstration projects, the clinically relevant uh, variance resource for, formerly named, known as ClinAction. Um, and the genomic sequencing and newborn uh, screening disorders. So, so a number of things out there and, and waiting to come back in. Um, last uh, fall, we also told you about a potential partnership with the Pharmacogenomics Research Network uh, uh, that's uh, led by NH, uh, NIGMS, uh, but we participate in with a number of other uh, NIH institutes. Um, and this was mainly building on their, what they call the very important pharmacogenomic gene um, sequencing platform, which was something that they had um, um, funded and, and we uh, contributed to in a, in a minor way, uh, developed to identify rare sequence variants in 85 pharmacogenetically important genes, and these were identified uh, within that consortium. Um, and Emerge, uh, the Emerge Network, our, our premier genomic medicine uh, program, uh, really is, is in a position now to apply 
provide this validated uh, VIP array for discovery and clinical care in, uh, in about 9,000 patients, so really a, a, you know, a dramatic uh, um, provision of, of increased information about the platform as well as its use in care. Um, one of the advantages of this platform, many advantages, are that it can be exported to other CLIA certified labs so that there is a, a mechanism um, developed to not only assay these, these variants but to get them uh, uh, CLIA certified. Uh, permit genotyping of common and rare variants as well as discovery of new ones uh, and use the PGRNs, what they call the, the CPIC group, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, which develops guidelines on, on how one can, can actually use these. And these are published and peer-reviewed, uh, so a very useful uh, resource. And so we're, we're partnering with them on that as well. And so what we see, uh, the PGRN uh, contributing is, is a state-of-the-art pharmacogenomics array, the ability to update that array because a, a number of, of uh, high um, uh, high octane sequencing centers are, are involved in, in developing that. Uh, they also have the drug gene, gene guidelines to help us with and CLIA standards and quality control. While Emerge can provide less pharmacogenomically focused labs, so really kind of take this out a little bit more into the community, not you know totally um, uh, away from the academic uh, setting, but, but at least less, uh, less of an emphasis there. A very large patient base with electronic phenotyping uh, and uh, a, a strong emphasis on privacy concerns and other issues related to to consent and, and agreement. Uh, so this was endorsed last year as a, as a uh, very viable way to move forward for Emerge and, and for, uh, for the Institute. And we might just note that partnerships like this permit rapid responses to pressing clinical questions. And you may have heard of uh, this very sad um, uh, report of, of actually multiple uh, fatalities after tonsillectomy in children given codeine um, who uh, had functional gene duplications for the CYP2D6, which is the major um, it's a, a gene that basically metabolizes or responsible for metabolizing uh, close to 25% of, of prescribed um, uh, drugs. And it caused a significantly pr a greater proportion of um, uh, production of potent morphine from its parent drug, codeine. This too happens in adults, but when it happens in a small person, the, the, uh, um, the effect is obviously much, much greater uh, and, and has led to some deaths. This actually led to the FDA <laughs> issuing a press release just a few weeks ago um, on, with a, a black box warning about uh, uh, use in, in some children following surgeries could lead to death. So, so we see this as an opportunity then to really be able to jump on things rapidly. Wouldn't it be wonderful, for instance, if we could survey 9,000 people and find out all the variants, or at least all the variants seen in those 9,000 people that might be associated with reduced, um, uh, or sorry, with increased uh, production of morphine and have that information available to be used and shared uh, and, and, and explored um, more in a, in a clinical setting. Um, just to put all of our efforts kind of in, in some kind of a context, uh, we've kind of listed up here our existing efforts, um, the, the Emerge Project and Emerge PGX, as I've mentioned, the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Program, the Phoenix Project, uh, looking at, at uh, developing phenotypes, uh, and the Genomic Medicine Meetings. And then the sort of dotted line uh, separates those that are kind of in um, uh, solicitation or in, in the idea stage right now. Um, and one can consider this to, the, of the areas that our Genomic Medicine Working Group as well well as the genomic medicine meetings have identified as, as kind of a, con a continuum or a, a series of, of progressions. Variant and association discovery really, uh, I think we've defined as not being part of genomic medicine. It's preparatory too, but certainly um, our major two programs are, are doing that. But then, you know, do we have transportable phenotypes so that we can share this information across studies and, and actually um, uh, gather among the rare variants uh, who might be having similar phenotype? Uh, phenotype exposures emerges heavily involved in, in developing phenotypes, and the Phoenix project, project is totally uh, devoted to, to developing transportable phenotypes. Um, evidence generation um, uh, variants, the clinical implications of these variants are also very important steps. Uh, consent and community concerns need to be explored. Reporting of these variants to patients and their use in clinical care, and I should mention the Return of Results Consortium, obviously working very heavily in this space. Clinician and patient education, policy development. And you can see that, as I mentioned previously, Emerge is, is probably our premier um, uh, genomic medicine program currently. Uh, and it's involved in all of these areas to, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, CSER is also uh, heavily involved in these, in these areas. The Phoenix I mentioned in, in the phenotype realm. Uh, the genomic medicine meetings have addressed several of these and are, are giving us additional ideas for how best to, uh, to pursue them. 
And then we can anticipate, although we don't know what, what's going to come in um, in applications and what will eventually be awarded, but uh, the clinically relevant variance research obviously is squarely in looking at the clinical uh, implications of these variants, um, to some degree also clinician education. The, the uh, genomic medicine demonstration projects um, cover a, a large number of these newborn sequencing. Uh, obviously a large number as well. Family history, I should have mentioned, there's, there should be a uh, consent um, um, and, and community family concerns uh, uh, check here, uh, but also evidence generation and, and patient education uh, and physician education will be heavily uh, involved there as well. So, so we see this as a, as, you know, a, a moving target, but, uh, but an overall whole that we hope to make even more whole as time goes by. Um, Rex's very optimistic slide that I, that I stole is that we might actually get there before 2020 uh, in terms of the, uh, the um, uh, getting more to the right. And, uh, and just like to recognize the, the contributions of many people supporting this effort, most, in, most particularly the people who participate in these meetings and who come, many of them at their own expense, um, to, uh, to provide their ideas, to look over our ideas and, and to give us input. Um, and, and especially the, the NHGRI folks who provide the infrastructure, uh, particularly our web team that is now video uh, casting or videotaping all of these um, meetings and, and posting them on our website for anyone to be able to look at. And I would just note the uh, professional societies meeting that Rex mentioned will be in Dallas in, in the end of January. So I'll stop there. Yes. Terry, there's a, there's a lot of activity in the community around the creation of a, a large database of genotype phenotype, variant phenotype information. And there was also a, a big meeting about a public-private effort in this regard with pharma uh, a while ago. So I'm just trying to understand in the larger picture how these things leverage each other, fit together, don't fit together. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I, I think um, much of that, that database and, and uh, uh, association um, of variants that's, that's going on is, is in, the, in the sort of the clinically relevant variants um, um, initiative that we're, we're bringing forward, the relationship of that. We saw that, you may remember in the, the two discussions that we held of, of that, we saw that as being the step that comes after um, one identifies what the associations are in the, in the consensus process building on those databases that we are delighted that are being put together, but we're not actively participating in those, but interacting with so them. So you think of this as for much further yes. downstream? I, I wouldn't say much, but, but further, further downstream. downstream. Yes. yes. Terry, I wanted to ask you if you, want, if you could comment on um, the piece that I didn't see talked about here, and that is decision support and engagement with some of the electronic medical record providers in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Rex probably should comment on that as well. Um, the, the Emerge um, project is, is heavily involved, particularly with Epic and Cerner, since those are the, the two main ones that are, that are working at, not to mention any proprietary names unduly, but those are the two that are, are heavily involved with Emerge. Um, so that, that is going on as well as uh, some discussion about, you know, should we bring, we, we invite them to our, our meetings and should we bring them and specifically focus on the electronic medical records uh, specifically. Rex, you yeah, I'll just mention that one of the goals of the current uh, Emerge group, uh, we have one of our uh, working groups is focused on uh, integration of uh, uh, genomic information back into electronic health records. Uh, we have a very strong presence, as you might imagine, uh, of groups that are using um, the EPIC platform. And so there's, a, there's been a real focus on trying to think about how best to go about doing that. And one of the deliverables I think Emerge will be providing is an approach for um, both how do you develop a logic for doing uh, decision support and then how do you actually physically integrate that with uh, an electronic health record system. And it, it's early days, but I, I think the, the, the thinking is that uh, models probably likely to look fairly similar to the way uh, radiology deals with having very large uh, external data sets that then integrate uh, into an electronic health record. Seems like a, a pretty good model that's attractive. We did have actually uh, all of the three big three electronic health records providers attend an, um, an eMERGE meeting, and I, I think it would be fair to say that what we learned from them is that they were looking to us as much to provide them guidance about where they should be headed as the other way around. I was going to say that, but my, my experience with that is that they, they're waiting to hear that their customers really want it. Exactly. And if they do? And, and so I think they will be hearing from, uh, at least from the Emerge project, some, some good ideas. Yeah. Long. 
A uh, quick question on your, your definition of scope there. You said genomic information about an individual. So is that including bacterial viral genomes or even somatic variation in cancer? So as you saw, the goal is to include somatic variation as well as germline variation. Um, you know, I, I think it's early days about whether you'd actually have uh, human microbiome samples for any of them yet. We just need to get the human part of that down first, but that's obviously a, an important next step that we've learned a lot about from some of the H NHGRI work that's happened in the last what, six months. So related to the somatic piece then, were, have there been many discussions about in the, in the payer and reimbursement space about learning the lessons that are ongoing right now from oncology and cancer? There, there have been some. Um, you notice the Genomic Medicine Working Group has a cancer, a Genomic Medicine Working Group has a cancer working group. And that's really been an important topic of discussion for them, is to think about uh, not only best practices and lessons that we've learned from that, but also to, to think about, you know, specific projects where we can uh, focus and get new data about some of the changes that we see in genome versus, uh, in the genome, germline versus somatic. Obviously, TCGA has a lot to offer us in that, so thinking about how to integrate with TCGA is a good opportunity for the future, but it, it, it has not been an area of focus yet. Yeah, Rick. Um, so, um, Rex, you, it, it, it sounds like almost everything, or indeed maybe everything, is allelic variation and not the sort of readout. You said RNA may be okay, but nothing downstream. Is that, is, is like measuring RNA, and certainly in our experience, and I'm sure Rick would, Wilson would say this too, that combining um, other readouts, especially when you integrate them, is actually really valuable. Epigenetic changes, DNA methylation, stuff like that. Is that just put aside for a while? It's fine if it is. I just wasn't sure if that's what it, you meant I, when you said. I think what you're doing is you're focusing on the definition of genomic medicine yeah. that was presented. Um, I, we could revisit the whole debate that we've had in, in the group about what the breadth of that should be. The goal was just to f focus initially on uh, primarily DNA. I don't even think we could honestly say we've gotten very far towards the RNA piece of this. Um, you know, as you know, RNA complicates systems dramatically because you need to capture the right tissue from the right time. And uh, so I, I think right now the focus is really pretty much squarely on DNA, primarily on germline, uh, but I think uh, ultimately they'll be expanding to somatic. I don't know, you want to add to that? Well, well I mean, all of you were provided, what we, what we aim for a one sentence definition, which ended up being a one pager, but how many bullets? It was because we needed to fill out so many caveats to just make sure we weren't overly narrow, overly broad. I will say, I mean, it's the second bullet there. Is what I believe here is that by, ge by genomic, NHRI means direct information about DNA and RNA, uh, putting the study of more downstream products derived from the genome, proteomics, glycomics, metabolomics, as outside our immediate focus view of genomics and therefore genomic medicine. Now, at the time, that might be um, of interest, but I would include epigenomics. I would include RNA analyses. I think biting all that off right now when they're thinking of the more clinical application might be a bit much, but I still think it should be within our, our near-term view. Let me, let me tell you why I'm bringing it up, because we do a fair amount of this not delivering to sure. the patients, but we do it for in our research, and we're finding out uh, by integrating DNA methylation, RNA, microRNA, a whole lot more than we are by sequencing the genome. Certainly, and, it, and it, it's complicated, but it's also reducing the genome. And you're not and, looking at everything. And in the case of cancer, for example, I think uh, there's a lot of thoughts about cancer d diagnostics of the future, not just be only looking at genome sequencing of tumors, a much broader view. So I think we should be very open to that. Technical one, the PRGN. Um, Array? That, that's really sequencing, though, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I just, this yeah. array so meaning array of genes. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, we're going to get all, the, we'll get the rare variants that are there from that process. Okay, thank you. Well, we are painfully on time. I just, oh, you, know, you build all these contingency plans and uh, everything's going so well. Um, well, I'll fall apart after lunch. So we're going to break for lunch now then, as scheduled, and I think we should just reconvene at 1 o'clock. It just seems to give everybody a chance to also talk. I know everybody likes to catch up and various things, so let's just 
have a, an hour break, but let's sharply reconvene here at uh, 1 o'clock.